Well, good morning. Hey, it's so good to be with you this morning. And if you're a first time guest, we're glad that you're here to, um, I just want to give a shout out. Yesterday, we had the opportunity to celebrate the baptism of Mike Guth. I think we've got a picture there. Could you give it up for Mike? Um, so um, it has been awesome to see what God has done in and through Mike's life. And I think part of the miracle is that Leah got in a pond, um, which if you know her, that is, that's like a godsend, right? She is a, a clean freak to the nth degree. Um, I, so uh, it, was, it was great. We got to celebrate on his family farm and, and really just see what God's done in his life and marriage and as a husband and father and son. So we're just thrilled. We're excited what God's doing through this church. Um, so um, it's summertime, and I, I thought back to vacation Becky and I had two and a half years ago. We had the opportunity to go to Italy. How many of you want to go to Italy? It was amazing. Great pizza, all the stuff. It was great. We got a few days to visit in Venice. We have a few days in Florence. We got to see all kinds of artwork and stuff. Uh, but there was nothing that compared to our time in Rome. Uh, we got to visit all kinds of historic sites. If you've ever been to an, you know, a really, really old city, you've seen kind of uh, different uh, buildings and all kinds of stuff, old churches. And uh, when we were going through, the thing that was really the highlight for us was seeing the Roman Colosseum. How many of you know what the Roman Colosseum is? Have you seen pictures online? I think we got a picture here. I took this panorama shot when we were there. It was beautiful. So at its heyday, this, this building would seat 45,000 spectators at one time. How amazing is that? 45,000. They would use it for gladiator fights and animal hunting, all kinds of stuff. And it's, it's pretty amazing uh, that it's still standing here today. Um, and, you know, as Becky and I were going through, um, we were just taken back by how beautiful it was and how preserved it was. And I remember walking through these hallways and I thought to myself, how is it in the midst of warfare and famine and, and changing regimes and all the things that Rome experienced, how is it that this building still stands? But to answer that question, you have to look beyond what you see with the naked eye. Uh, see, Emperor Nero started this building campaign uh, for the Roman Colosseum, and did you know, it is actually built where his personal lake was. How many of you would love a personal lake? I would love my own lake, Lake Josh. Um, instead, I deal with like a third of an acre backyard and a yippy five-pound dog. That's what I've got. Um, um, sorry. Anyways, um, so... Uh, he built this Colosseum on this site, and so he had workers that took out all the water from the pond, and, and they, they dig down to solid ground. I mean, it took years to do this. And then he filled it up with mud, you know, so much cement. It was just feet and feet and feet and feet of cement, so that this structure, this building that, it, that truly is, I mean, this jewel in Rome uh, would stand firm. And you know, I, I don't know about you, but how, how many of you know foundations are important? They're pretty important. Um, do you, do any of you guys watch House Hunters on HGTV? Doesn't it make you envious? I watch that and I'm like, I wish I had a $3 million budget, you know, to buy whatever. I'm like, you know, Becky and I are scraping a couple nickels together. But, um, but no, like we would watch that and it, the house could look beautiful, beautiful paint, awesome curb appeal, all this stuff. And then they say the word, hey, there's a messed up foundation and everything just stops, right? Because you know it's going to be a big, uh, you know, it's going to be a, a big expense to fix that foundation. Foundations are important. They, they provide stability. They, they provide security. It, it, it makes sure that you have level ground, solid ground underneath your feet. And uh, we're talking about that today. Uh, what we're talking about is throughout this whole summer, we have looked at the words of Jesus in Matthew 5 through 7, what's often called the Sermon on the Mount. And through this, Jesus has talked about a ton of different things. And really, he has invited you and I into this kingdom life, this transformative life of living differently, of embodying the life of Jesus. That's what you know, he has invited us into. So we've covered a lot of different stuff. But we finally got to the end of it. Some of you are like, amen, right? We're tired, and tired of being in this sermon series. But he gets to the end of it, and he says, here's the deal. I don't want you to just hear what I've told you. I want you to apply it, to embody it, to live it out. I don't want you to just hear it. I don't want you to just hear a sermon or a podcast or whatever. I want you to, to embody that life. And he gives this illustration of what it looks like to embody the life of Jesus. The illustration he gives is a man who builds his house on a rock, has a firm foundation and a man who builds his house on the sand and his house is swept away. 
And so what we want to talk about today is we're talking about, you know, the reality that you and I are building something every day. We're building a life. We're building our character. We're building a marriage, our family, our workplace. We're building something every day. Every choice is building. It's, it's paving. It's, it's adding a, a piece of foundation. And so the question we want to wrestle with today is, is our foundation set and steady? Are we the wise builder or are we the foolish builder? Because there's times, if I'm being honest, where I find myself having a foundation that's other than Jesus. Maybe you do too. So that's what we're going to talk about today in Matthew 7. I'd encourage you to open up your Bibles. Matthew 7, we're going to pick up in verse 24. I'm going to try to break this down for you as much as I can. Uh, verse 24 says this. Jesus says, therefore, and, and, and basically, therefore means tag everything else I've said on. So the past, really, this whole summer, all the things I've said about what it looks like to live for me, what it looks like to embody my life, to live to the fullest, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. So the first thing that we learn from this is a wise foundation comes from following Jesus' teachings. Notice what I didn't say. I didn't say uh, the, the, the wise foundation comes from attending church. Now, I'm not down in church. I'm a pastor. I'm supposed to tell you to be here. But that's not what the wise foundation is. It's not simply listening to a bunch of sermons or knowing a bunch about the Bible. That's not a wise foundation. No, it's, it's following Jesus' teachings. It's not just hearing but embodying what Jesus has called us to do. So he says, every one of you have heard what I've said to love your enemies and pray for other people and don't settle for being a hypocrite, but embrace a genuine faith. And when you feel like your heart is tending towards anxiety and worry and, and you're trying to figure out, you're trying to control everything, don't, don't seek to control. Trust in me as your provider. When you settle for lust rather than relationship, pluck lust from your life and, and delve into relationship. And when you have conflict with each other, don't just cut that relationship off. Seek reconciliation. Seek to make that relationship right. All those things. Everyone who hears that, and then they have the courage to live by it, that person is a wise person who builds their, ho their home on the rock. It doesn't just happen with listening. It happens with living. I guarantee, um, as people were hearing Jesus teach, they were like, duh, right? Right? Duh. Like, of course you're going to build your house on a rock. You're not going to build it on sand. How awesome would it be to build it on the water? You know, like that would be cool. But you're not going to build it on the water. You're going to build it on the rock. Duh. That's an obvious thing. But see, what Jesus is doing here is he's saying, I'm redefining what the rock is. You're going to think that your house is built on solid rock, that the foundation is set, but I'm redefining what it means for you to have a steady life, a strength-filled life. So he's redefining, he's changing our idea of what it means to build our lives on the rock. So let me just be very, very blunt and very clear. You can have perfect church attendance. Anybody here have perfect church? I don't. I was not here last week. So shame on me. I was with some friends in Nashville eating good food, listening to good music. That's what I was doing. Maybe you pray every day. Every single day you pray. You memorize the Bible. You, you know more about the Bible than anybody else. But, but I want to be clear. It's not that the perfect church attendance, you pray every day, you know a ton about the Bible. It's not just hearing. It's embodying and living out God's word. So God is not so much concerned with you attending a building more than he's concerned about you intend, attending his instruction, living it out, embodying it. Let me put it this way for the Bible nerds in the room like me. The, the amount that you know of the Bible doesn't determine whether you're wise or not. It's the way that you live your life. It's whether you embody Jesus' teachings, not just simply whether you know them. I intellectually get it. So the wise don't just hear, this is how God views money and sex and relationships and forgiveness and all these things. They're not just, it's just not hearing it, it's embodying it. Notice how James, Jesus' brother, puts it in his first chapter of his letter. He says this, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself, do what it says. And here's the funny thing about church attendance and hearing God's word and agreeing with God's word. Those things alone aren't the foundation that keeps your life together when you face storms. And we're going to talk about storms in a second. But those aren't the things that hold you together. Those aren't the things that when the waves crash against your life, those things alone aren't the things that hold you together. It's embodying the life of Jesus. Let me give you an example. How many of you are like me in, in a New Year's, you set New Year's resolutions? Anybody? 
like four people, great. Um, this illustration is going to tank. Um, so I do that. Um, every year, new start, uh, you know. So I'll tell you what I do. Every single year, I'll go into December, I'll, eat, I'll, I'll just eat a ton for Christmas. And then I'll shame myself about it. And then, um, and then we get to the new year, and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to eat healthier this year. I am. So I'll be at my mom's house, and I'll go on Amazon. I'm going to get that cookbook. I'm going to do those meal plans. I got it. Or, you know, maybe for you, you're like, hey, I need to exercise more. So you'll go buy the elliptical, right? Or you'll get the gym membership. Or, or you say, hey, you know, I need to get my finances in order. So you'll buy the book or get the Dave Ramsey plan or set up a, to schedule a time with the, the financial advisor. But how does that work usually? Like six weeks in, how's it go? I've forgotten what I said I was going to do like six weeks ago, right? Those are going to be these life-changing things for me. So, it, it, you know, in my case, if you buy the cookbook, uh, you, you know, you have all these meal plans and all this stuff because you want to eat healthy, but you never crack it open and you just eat McDonald's, yeah? Um, you buy the gym membership or get the elliptical, and the elliptical just sits and collects dust in your basement, and the gym membership, your, your shadows never even cast the doorway of the gym. You buy the Dave Ramsey stuff, scheduled financial advisor, but the truth is you don't make any of the stuff. See, there's something in us where we know intellectually what we are called to do, what's healthier, but we have a hard time doing it. Am I the only person who does that? I know what I need to do, but I have a hard time doing it. So it doesn't leave me healthier, stronger, more financially sound to knowing what I need to do. So there's not transformation that comes from knowledge, it's, it's obedience, it's it's embodying. Jesus continues, verse 25, he says, The rains came down, the streams arose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. The second point's this, a wise foundation will stand the storms of life. So when you build your house on the rock and you put into practice the teachings of Jesus, you try to embody Jesus in every single nook and cranny and sphere of your life, when you and I do it, Jesus doesn't say the storms will not come. He doesn't say, you know what, when you follow me, you'll never experience hardship. Can I get an amen to that? Wouldn't you love that to happen? If you just gave somebody the church, you never, you never were sick. You never had a weird relationship with your spouse or with your kids or with family members. Jesus doesn't say that. It's not that you won't face hardship in this life. It's in fact, Jesus, in the night he was betrayed, he said this. He said, in this world, you will face trouble. But take heart, for I have overcome the world. So prosperity preachers will tell you, if you give money to the church, you're never going to experience any problems. What Jesus tells you is you're going to face trouble. You'll face hardship and pains. There will be waves that crash against your house. You're going to feel like the stability of your home is threatened. And in that moment, take heart because Jesus doesn't say, I'm going to help you avoid the storms. He says, I'll help you stand in the midst of the storms. Then when it feels like everything is falling apart, Jesus holds you together. He is a firm foundation to build your life upon. You know, whether it's going through a financial crisis or dealing with a difficult or broken relationship, maybe for you, you're grieving because you've lost a loved one. You're fighting against serious health issues that have threatened your family. You've been laid off work or you've had trouble finding work. You're dealing with rebellious children. Maybe you're wrestling with addictions that continue to rear their ugly head, but you hide it. Or something else. Storms have a way of coming for all of us. And I think what ends up happening is when we go through a season of our life where we haven't really faced storms, we almost get the mentality of like a 20-year-old who goes, I'm invincible, right? I remember when I felt that way, and then I got chubby, right? And I'm not invincible anymore. <laughs> and just, thanks for the pity laugh there. Um, <laughs> Getting back on that elliptical. Um, but we have this invincibility feeling in us when we haven't gone through storms for a season of our life and then something happens. You know the thing I felt, and I'm just being honest with you, the thing I felt when I found that my foundation isn't set on Christ is when the storms come, I go, where is God? Where's God? When things are hard. And I'm equating whether or not I'm facing storms to whether or not God is a solid foundation for my life. See, the truth is storms come all of our ways. Whether you're following Jesus or not, whether you care about what God wants for your life or not, you'll face storms. 
And they'll come in all different shapes and sizes. And friends, you are not bulletproof. You are not invincible to those things. Every single one of us, no matter how faithful to Jesus you are, we all face troubles. Every one of us. It's one of the things I'm thankful for working in ministry. I have the opportunity um, in ministry to work in close proximity with stories of pain. It's something that I have cherished for years of being able to, to not fall into this, I'm invincible, life lasts forever, I can do whatever, but I've been surrounded by people who face struggles. You know, people call me up when they're hurting, when they're walking through the death of a spouse, when they're dealing with a miscarriage, and they find out that the cancer's back and it's aggressive, they deal with bankruptcy, they're on the brink of divorce. That's when I get phone calls. Very, very rarely do any of you call me and go, hey, Josh, I just want to let you know I'm having a great day. Hey, things are great. <laughs> just want to let you know. Beep. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> Never happens to me. Some of you are going to be like, this week I'm going to do that to you. Um, most of what I get are moments of vulnerability and honesty. And I'll tell you, I am thankful to work for a church where that's okay. Because not every church is like that. Very, very rare is it for people to be able to be honest and say, I'm struggling. And our marriage isn't great. And I'm doubting whether God's real. And it's one of the gifts that God has given me through working in ministries. I get to just have a front seat and join in with people and not judge them and not say, get it over it. Your storm's not that bad. But to be able to say, yeah, every single one of us goes through a storm and they look different. And so just to join in. So we all face storms and pain and struggles. I've seen people in ministry who in the midst of their pain and struggles and trials, they're real and they say, I'm not going to deny my pain and my suffering, but I'm choosing to trust God in the midst of it. It doesn't end up with this nice bow on top. It doesn't mean I don't wrestle with doubts or concerns, but I'm trusting that God has my good intentions at heart. That he's with me and for me. And he'll keep me standing when I feel like my knees are weak. And then I have also seen people whose foundations were not on Christ. And the truth is, when the waves raged against their life, their life just swept away. And I've seen both. So, every time that we choose to trust God, our faith grows. Every time. Um, I, you know, last week I mentioned I had the fr opportunity to get together with my friends. We've been friends for 20 years, best friends, amazing. We had a good time, played FIFA, yelled at each other, you know, just what friends do. And, um, and I thought back about my, my friendships with them, and I thought, you know what? Like, my trust in those friends grew every single time I was faced with a situation where I didn't know what to do, and I seek their counsel, and they gave me good counsel. You ever done that before? Like a friend gives you good counsel, you go, I can trust on them. How many of you have done the opposite, right? You go to a friend and go, I'm dealing with this, and they give you really bad counsel, and you, like it pans out, and you go, I'm never asking them again, right? That's happened. See, the same is true with God. When you and I decide in the small moments and the big moments to trust in God, and we say, God, I'm trusting you, God's faithful. And over time, as we trust him with the small things, we'll begin to trust him with the big things, the storms of life, the pains of life, the scars of life, we begin to trust him with those things. Our, our faith in God grows, our trust in God grows when we honor God with the small decisions, the small moments, and we create a track record of paving the way. Uh, so Jesus' promise, let me be clear, Jesus' promise is not when you follow me, you won't face storms. His promise is when the storms come, I will help you stand, I'll help you remain You'll still be here tomorrow. The storms don't have power over me. Then he finishes giving a warning. He says this, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the, on the sand. The rains came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. The third point's this. A foolish foundation will fall. It's not a question of if it'll fall, it's a question of when. It might be five years, 10 years, 20 years down the line, but a foolish foundation 
one that is not built on faithfulness to Jesus and embodying Jesus and following Jesus and believing that Jesus gives us the, the best picture of the full life on this earth, that a life that's built on anything else will eventually fall. See, this man experiences the same kinds of storms. The same storms rage against his house. It's the same scenario, but it has a different foundation. And when the storms come, the house that he spent years building crashes down and caves under the pressure of the storms. Now, I want to be clear. When that happens, it's not that God doesn't love you anymore. It's not that God's not for you anymore. See, God is a God of second chances and third chances and ten chances. Every single one of us could say amen to that, right? How many times have I needed more than a second chance? And God has continued to be faithful to me. It's not that God will not love you after the house comes crashing down. It's that he doesn't want you to experience the crash because of the storms. He doesn't want the life just to fall apart because it wasn't set on the right foundation. So God is forgiving and good and with us in the midst of all of it. He says, I don't want you to crash. You know, when I think of the times in my life that I built my life on something other than Jesus, um, I think of my life as a game of Jenga. How many of you remember Jenga? So basically, it's this tall tower of blocks that are really, really fragile, and they can fall over with an unsteady hand or with someone cheating and going, right? How many of you did that? Oh, that's, sorry. You know, like, that's what I would do. Um, But I look back on my life and I go, when my life wasn't built on Jesus, my life was so fragile. Like it was so fragile in that any time I faced a hardship, I always thought God was gone, God hated me, God had abandoned me. It was because that foundation was not set. You know, I think we listen to so many messages about what we should build our lives on. This is who you need to date. This is who you need to marry. This is the car that you need to buy, the house you need to buy. This is the neighborhood you should live in. This is how you should act. These are the priorities that you should have at the age that you should have them. This is the career you should have. This is the way you should raise your kids or your grandkids. You and I are told a billion different messages about the way we're called to live our lives. And too often, we allow the world to dictate the way that we pave our character. The kind of people we're becoming, the kind of foundation that we set. But I want to be clear, what Jesus tells us is that under the stresses of the storm, when Jesus is not the foundation of our life, our life looks like a game of Jenga. And the moment, the moment that we face hardship, it just feels like it crashes down. So don't be naive. You're building a life today. Right now, you're building something. Whether you believe in Jesus or don't, whether you're skeptical or not, Whether you're wounded or hurt or in pain or you're excited or enthusiastic, you're building a life. And it's not something you can say, no, I'll build that tomorrow, right? It's not like the trash, right, where you go, no, I'll get that later. You're doing it right now. Every single decision, every conversation, you're building your life. You're paving a foundation for the kind of man or woman that you're becoming, the the end goal that you have for your life, who you want to embody, you're doing that right now. And the question that you and I need to wrestle with is, is the life that I'm building, A, one worth building, and two, will it stand the storms that I'll face in this life? Those are two questions that are crucial for us to wrestle with. So here's what I want to do. Um, You know, we've talked about a lot this summer. Jesus gave us a lot to wrestle with. Um, And so I think we're going to put some things on the screen. These are the topics we talked about this summer. Um, Jesus talks about reconciling with someone who's wronged you. I'm guessing nobody in here wrestles with that at all. Um, He talks about embracing relationship rather than lust. He talks about loving your enemies. Casting off hypocrisy and embracing genuine faith. Praying to God. Embracing trust rather than worry and anxiety. And focusing on my sin rather than the sin of my neighbor. Now, you might be holier than me, and you're going, there's nothing on this list that I need to really work on. I'm good. But my guess is that you're like me. And when you see this list and you go, man, there's foundational pieces there that are missing in my life. There's things Jesus has called me to that the truth is I have heard, but I have not put in action. 
So here's what I want to do. Um, I want to just take a moment and pray. And I want to encourage you, wherever you're at, Christian or not, jaded or not, skeptical or not, hurt or not, going through a storm or not, I want you to find one of the things here that Jesus has, has told you and I one of the things that you would say, you know what, if I'm honest, that's not embodied in my life right now. I'm not living it out right now. And it'd be, it'd be amazing. It'd be ama- overachievers in this room if you go all of them. I want to embody all of them. Great. You're awesome. But if you're like me, it could be overwhelming. It can be overwhelming to see this and go, man, I just feel like I'm missing so much. I feel like my life is like a Jig Jenga game. You know, I'm like, oh, it's just so unstable. And what I want to encourage you to do is find one of these things you feel like God is calling you this week to embody, to follow, to obey, to live out. One thing. I'm just going to give you space. Look at the screens. Find one thing and we're going to pray together. Just so we're transparent, I'll tell you what mine is. Um, I feel like God has said, you need to reconcile with someone who's wronged you. And I have legitimized putting it off. I've created a ton of excuses as to why I don't need to do that, because it's easier not to. But I feel like God's saying I need to do that. So here's what I want to do. Um, I want to encourage you to close your eyes. We're going to pray together. And I want to pray that God would give you strength and courage and wisdom and knowledge beyond your years to be able to not just hear what he said to you, but to live it out. Whatever it looks like. So I want to pray right now, if you're like me and God has said to you, you need to seek reconciliation with a person in your life who's wronged you. My hope for you, my prayer for you is that you would seek reconciliation this week that you would seek to make that relationship as whole as it can be. And that you would not only hear what Jesus is saying, but that you'd do it. Amen. If God's told you this week to embrace relationship over lust and you have an addiction to pornography or you've been struggling with lust in your life, my prayer for you is that you would ruthlessly pluck it from your life, that you would have strength and discipline to cut it from your life so that you can embrace a life worth living that is full of vulnerability and relationship and goodness and risk. if God has told you to love your enemies. My hope for you is that this week, you would not just intellectually know you should love your enemies, but you would find tangible ways to love people who have hurt you, who have stood against you in opposition to you. If God has told you to cast hypocrisy from your life and you are living two lives, three lives, 10 lives right now, my prayer is that you would embrace genuine faith, that you would be honest with yourself this week and be able to live your life for Jesus, trusting that God doesn't care about the impression you give, he cares about your heart. If God's told you this week to pray, My my hope for you is that you would take risks by praying to God, that you would pray big prayers and small prayers, whatever they may be, whatever is on your mind, whatever you are consumed with, you would bring those to God and trust that he is with you and for you and will provide for you. If God has told you to let go of worry and to trust in him, my hope is that you would release control right now. That you would lean on his provision, his timing for your life. And if God has told you to focus on your sin rather than your neighbors, my hope is that you would ruthlessly pluck the sin from your life. Not because 
you want to put on some front, not because you want to be able to judge another person, but because you want to have the character of Jesus. And when you have the character of Jesus, other people who don't know him will be transformed because they see him in you. So whatever God is telling you, whatever God is speaking to you, my prayer is that you and I would do it. That we would not simply hear, but that we would put Jesus' words into actions. So God, we thank you for today. Give us the strength to live out the life that you have invited us to. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.